Um, my name is Alan Gates, and I am a Hive committer and also a longtime contributor to various Hadoop projects and one of the founders of Hortonworks. And I'm here today to talk about uh, work we've been doing to make Hive work for analytic workloads. So this will be a little bit of history, kind of what have we done, a little bit of futures, where are we going, and um, also show some kind of benchmarks of how we're doing on performance and uh, just general, you know, roadmap. And maybe I'm not pressing the right button. Is it? Yeah, the green arrow. All right, while we work on getting uh, a pointer that works, I actually happen to know it's on the next slide. Um, do it now, there we go, cool, thank you. Um, okay, so um, you've probably heard Hortonworks and perhaps the media talk about the Stinger initiative in Hadoop. Um, so what was this about in a, you know, we talk about s speed scale and SQL, it, but in a nutshell, the goal here was Hive was already good at scale. That was its, his, its history. It came from an ETL background. Um, it could already handle terabytes or even petabytes of data and queries. But if you want to take Hive and make it suitable for analytic workloads, if you want to have um, analysts and tools and stuff connected to it, what it does, you know, just scale isn't enough. You need two more things. You need speed and you need uh, sufficient SQL support. So let me just talk a little bit about what that means and who we're aiming this at. So we're not aiming to be 100%, you know, SQL 2011 or compliant or SQL 92 compliant or whatever, you know, pick your number. What we're aiming to do is make enough SQL that our target audiences can use us for what they want to do. What is it they want to do? People are pouring their data into Hadoop. They want their analysts who are SQL experts to be able to use that. They want to point their existing BI tools at it, right? They don't want to have to say, okay, well, I put all my data in Hadoop, but I, now I have to move it somewhere else so that my tools can actually work with it. Um, all those tools speak SQL, so, and a more complex SQL than Hive had uh, a year and a half ago. So we want to expand the SQL to do those, the things those people want. So again, we're not adding every last thing. You know, we're not adding triggers. We're not adding, I don't know, XPath queries, whatever other things you can think of. But we are trying to add the SQL features that these people expect and are going to use. And I'll go through what a lot of those are. Also, you want speed, right? You want this to be interactive. In, when, with Hive 10 a year and a half ago, if you, you know, Hive was very much a, what I call a coffee time query processor. You start a query, you go get a coffee. If you're lucky, when you come back, it's finished. Um, maybe you even go play a game of foosball or something. That's obviously not going to hit our target audience here. This needs to return in human, what I call human time. So I don't use the term real time because to me real time means stock tickers. You know, you're moving at hundreds of queries a second. Uh, that's not what we're aiming for here. That's not the right kind of system for that. But it is, I want a human to be able to sit down at a terminal and interact with this thing. And that may be through typing um, SQL queries. More likely it's through a tool like uh, Excel or Tableau or MicroStrategies or something where they're clicking on things and that tool is generating queries in the background, but they want their spreadsheet or their graph or whatever their report to be generated quickly uh, in line with the speed that they're working, not, not at a very slow pace. So that's the goal. So um, with the release of Hive 13, uh, 0 0.13 here uh, last or two months ago now, um, you know, we're saying Stinger's wrapping up. We've done a lot of this work. So just a little a few highlights of where we've been, what we've done. Um, we've done three releases over 13 months. It's actually about 18 months of work. So, you know, depending on how you count, it's, you can get different amounts of time. We've had 145 separate contributors. So that means people, 145 different people have committed patches or contributed patches rather to this from 44 separate entities. So this is very much a community effort. This is really important to us. So in fact, it's huge. We really want to, um, focus on how much the community is contributing to this. We think that's important. Um, it's been over the course of three releases, 0, 0.11, 0, 0.12, and 0, 
And it includes about 392,000 lines of code. So it's a lot of code, right? We've, we've made some very significant changes here. So um, are we done? Of course not. Um, we're not even close to done. So to, um, you know, to quote Winston Churchill, this is, we're, this is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end. But it is the end of the beginning. We've gotten Hive in a spot where it can now start to be used for these kind of things. There's still tons and tons of work to do, and I'll go over some of that. I don't want to give the impression that we feel like we've you know, uh, gotten there, but at least we're on the road now. And I think that's, a, you know, that's something pretty huge compared to where we were 18 months ago. So let me talk a little bit about benchmarks. Um, you may have seen uh, Hortonworks published a benchmark a partial TPCDS benchmark with Hive uh, Monday, I believe it was. Um, so TPCDS, I'm going to guess everybody here knows what the TPC benchmarks are. If you don't, uh, you know, Google will help you with that. Um, the DS one is for decision support queries. These are the types of queries we're targeting. This is where you're looking at data warehousing type information, trying to make decisions, um, things you would, your analysts or your tools would use. Um, we ran 50 of the 99 queries in that set, so why didn't we run the other 99? Because we're not finished yet, because there are still some of those queries Hive can't run. Right? We, we cannot do all those queries. I want to be very upfront about that. Um, we ran the 50 we could. As time goes on, we'll add more and more to that number. So uh, our test bench there is actually available on GitHub, um, and you can look at exactly how we run this. We ran it on 20 machines each with 256 gigs of RAM, but we only used 48 gigs for Hive. Um, the reason we did that is that more closely emulates how we see people using this. They don't, people don't always have 256 gigs per machine. Um, we did not explicitly pin anything in memory, so this is not buffer cached. We're not, you know, we're not necessarily reading for buffer cache. Given that the TPCDS data set is three fact tables and a bunch of dimension tables. I suspect the dimension tables were probably in the file cache when this was run. So those are probably being read by, from memory, but the fact tables are not, they're too big. Uh, each machine had six drives, 10 gig interconnect. Um, you see the processors there. And then we ran this at a scale of 30K, which means 30 terabytes of total data. So um, that's the entire data set. The dimension tables are small no matter how you scale it. So Basically, to a first approximation, that means each of the fact tables was 10 terabytes. It's not quite because they're not equal size, but it gives you an idea of the total data size. The point here is this is big enough that we're not fitting this in memory. Um, we can't even always fit the intermediate results in memory. So what we get, um, I apologize, this is a bit of an eye chart, and it's split up. So this is the queries that finished in um, under 1,000 seconds. I'm not gonna go over all those, obviously, but you get an idea that it varies. Uh, I think the minimum there is query 21, which is um, very simple looking at one day's worth of data. The full data set is a year, so that's a, a small subsection. 21, I think, finished in 19 seconds or something like that. Um, one other thing I wanna be upfront about is our optimizer is not yet smart enough to realize when a join is gonna trim the scan space tightly, so this query like query 21 here, if we ran it exactly as specified in TPCDS, it would take much longer because it would scan the entire thing before it realized, oh, I'm actually only gonna, you know, the join is gonna narrow that to one day worth of data. So we actually rewrote that so that it was explicit in the where clause so our optimizer could figure it out. Um, so that's something, that's work we need to do in our optimizer to make that work, but we did not change what these queries returned, we did not change semantically how they work. There's no limit clauses in here, anything like that. Um, so all we did was help out our optimizer a little bit. There's also a few queries that take longer. I put these on a separate chart just so you could see, you know, otherwise their scale just dwarfs the scale of the others. Everything else came out super short. So query 13 here, obviously the, the maximum running two and a half hours, that's actually a full scan across a year's worth of data. So and a fairly complex query. Um, query 64 there is actually a fact-to-fact -fact join across a year's data. So that's two 10 terabyte tables joined um, across a year, and you, that took slightly over um, two hours. So 
that still seems like a long time. It's hard to claim interactive for two hours, but when you think you're doing a fact-to-fact -fact join, you know, two 10 terabyte tables, we're not feeling too bad about that, especially considering a year and a half ago, I think that query took all day, literally all day. Um, so that gives you a little bit of an idea where we're at. As I've said, are we happy with this? No, we still have plenty of space to go, but we're feeling better than where we were a year and a half ago. So let me talk a little bit about kind of the, I said, you know, we were doing, for Singer, we want to do speed, scale, and SQL. I want to talk some about the SQL work we've done, talk through a little bit what we've added, and then give you a notion of where we want to go in the future. So Hive 11 added uh, windowing functions in the over clause. So this is row, rank, uh, row number, rank, those kinds of things. We added these first uh, because when, again, we here is the community. This was actually contributed by SAP. Um, these were added first because someone who wanted to work on them and because this is something that's very commonly done in these types of queries. The fact that Hive couldn't do these was limiting and this isn't, I, I think if you work hard enough at it, you can actually write a SQL query that does the same thing without the over clause, but it's extremely painful. So this was you know, one of those things where you wanna add it because it's not easy for a person to fix it. Um, in Hive 13, we added subqueries in uh, where and having within and exists. We added common table expressions, which is the with clause. Uh, you can add, put join conditions in the where, that's completely boring, but it's a lot of the tools do that, right? And then uh, we added the ability to actually create permanent functions. So in the past in Hive, functions were always temporary. You always had to add them as part of your query, which meant that you had to have the jar and you had to worry about shipping it. Now you, with Hive 13, you can an admin on the cluster and actually only an admin for, for uh, for security reasons, can create a function and push, place the jar in HDFS, and then users can access that without having to upload it all the times themselves. There's not yet um, security controls on that, on who can execute it. Um, I'll talk more about that later. So where do we wanna go from here? What do we need to add? I feel like the important things to add next are true temporary tables. So it's very common, especially a lot of these BI tools will create a temporary table in their session and do a lot of work with it and they just expect, you know, the SQL semantic is when your uh, session's over, the temp table vanishes, you're, it's not your job to drop it or anything. We wanna add those. Um, we wanna add subqueries that work with equality and inequality operators, uh, plus the ability to do multiple subqueries per, uh, per query. Our rewriter can't handle that yet. We need to do full union support today. You can only do, uh, you can't do union believe you can only do union all and only in certain circumstances we need to um, we need to expand that and we need to add the set operators uh, security this is obviously important to a lot of people in hive 12 and before there were couple a couple type of security options there was a storage based authorization provider which just took whatever it saw in HDFS on the files that represented the table and applied those to the metadata. So if you had permission to read the files, you could, um, you could read the table. If you had permission to delete the files, you would be able to drop the table, for example. That, is, that has the advantage of being secure because HDFS is secure, um, but it has a disadvantage, it's very coarse grained. It's not the way SQL people think about stuff. You couldn't do grants and revokes, any of that kind of stuff. Um, then there was also the default, which was completely advisory. It was not enforced. Um, anybody had permission to grant anything to anybody. It, it was just there for bumpers, really, to keep people from making silly mistakes. But that's not, at least in my opinion, that's not security. In fact, I actually think that's worse than not having security. If you're truly in an insecure environment, you should know it so you're careful. If you deceive yourself into thinking you're secure, then you're, you're actually in trouble. So in Hive 13, we've added um, standard SQL authorization. So we actually do grants and revokes now. You can, uh, when you create a table, you can grant permission to another user and you can choose whether to grant that user also permission to grant other users or not. Uh, we've added roles, this, uh, traditional SQL roles. And we can now do column and row level permissions via views. So if I have a table, and for example, it ha say I'm a manager, I have a table with all my employees, I want some of my employees to be able to see it, but they shouldn't be able to see each other's salary information. I can create a view that doesn't include the salary column and then grant permission to that on the, to my employees. 
they can see the columns they're supposed to see, they can't see the you know, salary or whatever else they're not supposed to see underneath. Um, so that's there in Hive 13. Um, one caveat with that is because of the way Hive's built, that doesn't work with the standard Hive command line because the standard Hive command line talks directly to HDFS. If you can talk to HDFS, you can undermine um, any security we put on top of it, right? If you have permissions to read the files. So that works when you use it through Hive Server 2 or, or Beeline, something where you're not actually directly connecting to HDFS. Um, next steps, we want to integrate this with XA Secure. Um, which I, I imagine you guys have heard that has been acquired by Hortonworks and is being open sourced. And um, we want to extend the security to cover execution of functions. So as I said today, a, an, a, only an admin can add a function. We need to also give the ability for that admin to say, okay, only these users can execute it because you may want to control who can or cannot execute functions. Um, data type conformance. So starting with Hive 10, Hive had a very, uh, Java type model, Java centric type model. That doesn't work well when you go to connect this to BI tools, when you give it to SQL people who say, what's a string? Uh, what's a string is an even more difficult question when a Teradata system or an Oracle system or you know, Tableau asks that question because they don't think in strings, they think in cars and bar cars, which come with limits and come with sizes. Um, so we set about adding these data types, which we've done um, decimal was added in Hive 11, date and varcar in 12. In 13, we added car and then user-defined precision and scale for decimal. Um, so ACID, every good database system needs some ACID. Um, in Hive 12 and before, you could insert at the partition level. You could not insert individual rows. Uh, there was no update or delete. There was no um, there was some locking available, but it required Zoo Zookeeper as an add-on. Um, in Hive 13, we have added um, ACID compliance streaming ingestion, so you can now hook up Flume or a tool like that and stream data in constantly, and your readers can see that instantly. There's no need to wait for a partition to be created. You don't have to create a new partition per hour or whatever. This is actually pretty pretty important. This means that within seconds of your data arriving from wherever you're bringing it, um, your users can see it. There's no, no longer that wait as you say, okay, every hour or every day or every 15 minutes, whatever it is, I add a new partition. Um, that's there in Hive 13. The next steps we're working on right now is adding the, this to the language so you can do things like insert values, you can do updates, you can do deletes. Uh, we also want to add multi-statement transactions so you can say begin, commit, rollback. And then we want to integrate that with HCatalog so that users coming in through PIG or MapReduce or whatever else can also make use of this. Um, there's a talk where Owen and I, who are the two engineers doing the work on this, will um, go through this in detail today at 5.30 if you're interested to learn more. Um, an optimizer. Every good SQL system also needs an optimizer. Early on, Hive could get by with having only a rules-based optimizer because, as I said, it was doing pretty standard workloads. And it could just do you know, simple things, push filters in front of joins, um, evaluate where clauses as early as you can, all those sorts of things. Um, that doesn't work, though, in analytic workloads where you have many way joins. There's no rule that can tell you definitively what order to do joins in. You have to use a cost-based optimizer to say, OK, I estimate this is um, you know, I, if I've got a five-way join, there's five factorial different orders I could do this in, right? Which one is gonna be the best one? Um, and the other thing is, as Hive itself just gets more complex, as it handles more complex queries, it's now possible, actually, in some situations for Hive to generate multiple plans. Without a cost-based optimizer, it simply has no idea which one's better. There's no way for it to make that decision. So we have, uh, we are working with a project called Optic, which we're using in Hive now, um, to be our cost-based optimizer rather than kind of build this from scratch. Uh, at first, it will work on join ordering. That's kind of the first, um, first step. And uh, so we're doing work with that. We're also doing a lot of work to expand the statistics collection. There is already statistics collection that goes on in Hive. You can say analyze table. Also, some of the newer file formats, such as ORC, um, can, will automatically collect statistics, and Hive can fetch those from the 
indexes created by those file formats rather than having to you know, read the entire data set to get the statistics. There's a lot of expansion work still to do there, so we will be doing that. Uh, Julian Hyde, who is the, um, the lead on Optic, will be giving a talk today at 4.30 on this. Um, if you're interested, I encourage you to um, go and learn more. All right, so let's talk about, uh, let's switch back to the performance now. Um, it's kind of de rigueur these days to, to say that MapReduce is dead. Um, I don't know how many times I've read a blog where people are like, oh, Hive is on MapReduce and MapReduce is dead and blah, blah, blah. Yeah, MapReduce, well, I don't know if it's dead, but um, it's, it's, not, it's not gonna be the system that underlies all these interactive query engines, right? MapReduce is definitely batch, no question. Uh, that doesn't mean Hadoop is dead. It doesn't mean um, that Hive is dead. It just means we need a better execution engine underneath. Um, so this is where Tez comes in. I am not gonna go in depth on Tez here today, just in the interest of um, having time to cover all the, all the cool stuff going on in Hive, plus there's great talks um, already today on uh, Tez that I encourage you to go to if you're interested. I will say this little bit. The basic idea here is Tez, instead of being just map and reduce, it is it, a general DAG execution engine built with relational type operator, uh, relational type applications like Hive and Pig in mind, right? That is, a, it's built to work underneath those. It didn't take, when I, I started actually in the Pig project long before I worked on Hive, and it, I wasn't in the Pig project very long before I, I went to Arun and Owen and those guys in the MapReduce project and said, you guys really need to generalize MapReduce. It should be able to do all these other things. And they're like, no, it shouldn't, it's great. I'm like, it's great, but it should be able to do all these other things. And they're like, no, it shouldn't. And, and I understand why they didn't want to do that. It would have made MapReduce much more complex. It would have been in, in the Hadoop one world where MapReduce was not only the execution system but also the scheduler, it would have been very hard to make those changes. Um, with the addition of Yarn, with that separation of concerns so that Yarn is now the scheduler, MapReduce becomes just an execution engine and you can build others. It it's much easier now to build something like Tez, which is just an alternate execution system. And so that's what it is. It's this ability to do it all in a, in a DAG. It, um, it doesn't have to transfer data between tasks by disk. It doesn't have to schedule separate MapReduce jobs. It just has all kinds of advantages and can you know, give us a lot of these performance benefits we're seeing. Both Pig and Hive actually are being uh, ported to this. Um, and I, you know, I forgot to put it up here, which is unfortunate, but there's also a pig on Tez talk today I, at 1.45 or two, you'll have to check the schedule, but um, if you're interested, that's there as well. All right, um, so I've alluded a couple times now to different file formats. So part of the work that's gone on here too has been the realization that Hive didn't have the right storage formats to do these analytic workloads. Um, when it was in an ETL engine, it was mostly focused on doing text or sequence file or RC file, which RC file was a columnar format. Um, those all are fine and have their uses, but when you wanna have a read-heavy workload that's focused on these um, analytic-style queries, there's just a series of things you want to do in the file format, and uh, ORC, or optimized RC file, is an effort to do that. And this is something, again, where I want to call out how much the community has done. Uh, we started looking at this inside of Hortonworks. We talked with uh, some of the team at Microsoft that works on SQL Server PDW, and they showed us some of the work they've done in their system, and they actually helped us design a lot of the ORC work. So this is loosely based on some of the work inside SQL Server um, that's been done, frankly, in a lot of these uh, analytic data engines. So it's, um, it is built tightly integrated with Hive's data types. This actually is important for a number of reasons. This means that it is, it is data type aware, unlike all the other storage formats Hive had before it. And that means it can do different compression on different types of types. For example, with, um, with integers, it, it stores them in run length encoding, because that's a very efficient way to store integers. It does, especially if you happen to have sort order, you know, happen to have a sorted column. It, uh, 
uses dictionary encoding for strings or uh, binary types, all that you get automatically. So, for example, with the 30 terabyte data set that I showed um, for the TPCDS queries, I believe it actually, once it was written in ORC, it was actually six terabytes of data. Um, just due to these, the compression, the lightweight compression used here. You can still do, on top of that, something like bzip or snappy or um, uh, LZO, whatever you want to do on top, if you want even more compression. The other, uh, or an, another, not the other, but another key feature of ORC is that indexes are built into it, so every 10,000 rows, which ORC calls a stripe, so if I start talking about stripes, that's what I mean, it's these sections of 10,000 rows. Um, it keeps a certain number of statistics, so it, it will keep min, max, sum, and count for each column. Um, these are useful in several ways. They're useful in statistics collection, so the op and when you say analyze a table, I want to find out about the statistics, you can, um, it can simply ask this index rather than having to scan all the data. This, these are also very useful for what we call predicate pushdown. So envision that you're doing a query where you say, I want to know about all, my, all the transactions by my users that live in the state of Oregon. With this index, it, well, okay, so let's assume that you're keeping the, st keeping the data ordered by state. With this index, if you find that this uh, stripe only contains users that live in uh, between the state, you know, in Indiana to Iowa, you know, I'm somewhere in the eyes, then I, I automatically know no one in Oregon is in this list, so I just skip the block when I'm seeking. This is predicate pushdown. And it's very useful when you're doing uh, large query operations because you may not realize at planning time, that, I mean, one, if you've imported enough of these statistics in your optimizer, you can do it at planning time, but even if you haven't done that, even if your optimizer hasn't taken advantage of that, at scan time, you can still figure out, oh, I don't need this block, and you can just seek over it to the next block. So that's very important. Um, I don't think I covered, ORC is a columnar format, so in HDFS it doesn't work out to store columnar file, columnar, different columns as different files because of the way HDFS does block location. It's not real good at allowing you to co-locate blocks. So even though it's columnar, it's, all st it's stored in one file, but it's arranged by columns. So each of these 10,000 row stripes that I talked about the columns are split out in different sections, so if you only want to read columns two, three, and five, it will seek to column two, read it, read column three, seek to column five, done. No need to, to read, decompress, deserialize all the other records before, um, before returning the data. Um, so I mentioned this has been in there since Hive 11. I um, think I covered most of the things that I've already put in in 12 and 13, um, so uh, oh, one other thing I should talk about here in 12 that we're actually improving is, um, so hi, uh, ORC, sorry, has these stripes. Initially, those weren't lined up with HDFS block boundaries, so that meant that almost every time you were reading a stripe, you ended up crossing a, a, block, a block boundary, which meant that you're reading at least part of your block non-local in most cases, or actually in two-thirds of the cases which is non-optimal, so work went in to pad those block, uh, or pad those stripes, sorry, so that they line up with the blocks. Turns out the initial implementation of that's only moderately efficient, so there's work going on now to actually improve that so that the, the buffering is done better, we don't waste so much space with it. Um, what else in there? Oh, this is integrated with the vectorization stuff, which I'll take, talk about in a minute. It's also integrated with the ACID. Uh, work. So for the ACID to be supported, your file format needs to be able to store a, a row ID and a transaction ID. Um, we don't require ORC for that, and it's all done through interfaces, so any other file format could implement it. But so far, ORC's the one we've implemented it on. Um, all right, so vectorization, I alluded to this. Um, yesterday there was a wonderful talk by the Actian uh, guys, uh, Peter Bosch talked about the work they've done in uh, originally in VectorWise, now owned by Actian. Uh, this is, you know, we're following their script on this, have been for a while now. So we're very happy they published that paper 10 years ago or whatever it was, 10, 11 years ago. Um, so what is the notion here? The idea is that 
um, in general, or in the textbook case, if you go buy a, a database textbook and you uh, read about how do I implement a database operator, it's gonna tell you to build a chain of operators and it's gonna, you're gonna pull one record at a time through there in an iterator model. That's very traditional. So if you had a, you know, a query that's selected something and then filtered it, you're gonna see a scan followed by a, a project followed by a filter and they're gonna pull all the way through. Um, that's fine, it works, but it's not super efficient because for every record you're going through this chain of uh, calling different functions. Um, Hive added to that inefficiency by storing all, the, each record was actually an array of Java objects. So that meant that you had no control over memory locality. You're pulling all these different columns. You have no idea where in the uh, memory space those, are point, you know, those pointers are pointing to. You're bouncing all over the place. Um, so the, the realization behind the vectorization work is pretty much too, well, is that you, you don't wanna do those things, right? You want to be very efficient in the way you use your CPU. And there's a couple ways you do that. One is you process rows in blocks of a thousand at a time or so. Basically, you size that block so that it fits in your L1 cache. That's really what you want because a cache miss costs, costs something around the order of 100 uh, clock ticks on your CPU. So anytime you say, okay, I want this record and now I've missed my L1 cache, I've gotta go fetch that, my CPU's gonna go do something else or sit idle for 100 clock, uh, clock ticks. That's not cool. So you size these so that you can fit them in your cache. Um, now think about Java for a moment, what I just said about it being in the object model, you can't control um, data layout in Java's object model, there's no new placement uh, uh, method like there is in C++, right, where you can say, okay, I wanna create an object, but I wanna do it here, that's totally out of your control. So that means to make this work, you have to do it as um, arrays of scalar types, right? You have to basically go back to C programming here and forget about objects and lay all this out yourself so that Java doesn't mess up where you put things. Um, the other th thing about this is you write code that's very tight so that there's, if you can avoid it, no branches inside your inner loop when you're processing these thousand records. Occasionally, uh, for obvious reasons, you can't avoid that. If you're writing a filter operator, you have to branch, right? But you, you work as hard as you can to make it so that if there is a branch in there, it's gonna go the same way as often as it can so that you get the right branch prediction stuff going on in the CPU. Because again, a branch misprediction causes a pipeline flush, which I think is around 15 clock ticks or something. So again, you're wasting time on your processor. Um, so that's what you, oh, and uh, you also write it so there's no function calls in there, right? You don't want any stack pushes, all those kinds of stuff. You want this all very tight code. Um, so. We worked on this and the initial implementations, we got something like 30X improvement on number of rows processed just in a given operator, not over the entire query. Um, you know, we, even on laptops, we were seeing things on the order of 100 million rows a second. That, we found that pretty impressive. Um, in Hive 13, this is there for initial, what you would have in the old world called map tasks. So um, things like select, filter, the initial aggregation, initial sort, that is vectorized. Um, what we're working on now is vectorizing so that the shuffle can be done, so you can actually shuffle these blocks of thousands of records together, and that what we would in the old world have called reduced tasks, subsequent tasks. See, I need new vocabulary here, that's my problem, I don't have, a, I don't have words for these yet, but um, what you would have used to call reduced tasks, the, the actual hash joins, uh, final aggregation, final sort, that work is now being, they're working on uh, vectorizing that. Um, so, this stuff is available. Hive 13, as I said, is, has been released. Um, so you can download that from Apache. You can, get, um, you can get this from Hortonworks as well in HTTP 2.1 that's available in a sandbox format where that's something that's suitable to run on your laptop. Comes uh, basically put that in VirtualBox or VMware Fusion, whatever your favorite uh, uh, VM is on your system, or uh, if you're ready to put it on your cluster, you can download it from HTTP, or I mean, download the full HTTP. And that's it, so questions, I guess, the, I don't see Mike, so I guess you just raise your hand and I'll repeat the question. Uh, 
Okay, so the question is, can I talk a little bit about acid? And the answer is yes, I'd love to at 5.30, but no, I will answer your question. So the, um, how's it being stored? Yes, we're doing it as a Delta store, right? You can't do updates in place in HDFS, that's not there. Even when you look at system, even the, all the, um, if you look at the way SQL Server does this, um, or ve um, well, VectorWise, or Vertica, all these guys, even though they could have done it in place, they chose not to, they are doing the Delta store as well. It's simply much faster. So yeah, we do, we store it in a Delta, you do the merge on read, and then there's a compactor, there are compactor threads that come along in the background and uh, tie it all up, you know, recompact it so you have a single source again later. Yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so question is in ORC, I talked about stripes, how does that affect partitioning? Stripes are sub-partitioned. So you're still partitioned as before, um, and within a given partition you would have stripes. Part of the goal though with ORC, and especially with the ACID work, is to reduce the need for partitions. One of the reasons we had to do ACID, that sounds fun, but one of the reasons we had to do that is because today Hive is completely dependent on partitions to add new data, and we want to break that, right? I think there was one here, yes. How are we storing the transaction information? And I'm not gonna have anything to talk about at 5.30. Um, the, we're using the Metastore for that, right? So we didn't, uh, actually one huge advantage we had is we didn't have to go write a whole transaction manager. Okay, so the question is going to talk a little bit more about security and it, in the past when you went through Hive Server, you had to run basically as the Hive user is what you're saying. So it is, um, so what we've done is high, uh, the, for the security stuff to work, the data has to be accessible, not necessarily owned by, but accessible from the user running Hive Server 2 or however you're coming in. So Hive Server 2 can, if you've got uh, say Kerberos authentication turned on, it can authenticate that you are who you say you are and then make decisions about whether to, you should be able to do that or not. It will then still actually run the job underneath as the Hive user so that it can access the data properly. That's why I said you can't do this from the command line, right? From the command line we have no ability to control, say you writing a, a user defined function that actually goes underneath us and reads the whole file. So we, we just simply can't secure it from there. Um, but we do, we can secure it when you're coming through something that's blocking you off from HDFS and where we can manage the switch between the users. Yes. So. Uh, to summarize that, you said what it means is you can rely on user-based security but actually run underneath as the Hive user, and that's correct. That's exactly what we're aiming for. Other questions? Yes. Um, so the question is, for the stripes of the org file, does it capture all statistics for all columns or only some? And the answer is all. So it, it does do all of them. Because um, they're simple enough and small enough. In the future, we've looked at things like would we want to add um, histograms or um, uh, the um, things, bloom filters, that's the word I'm looking for. That obviously we wouldn't do for every column because that would overwhelm us, right? So then we would have to get more intelligent about when do we want to do that and when do we not. But so far they're so cheap and small that it's just effective to do it for everything. There was a question over here, yeah. How do we handle streaming data? For the ACID stuff, you mean? Or? So um, there's a new interface called Hive H Catalog Streaming, I think it is, that actually does, it has an open, a write, and a commit, and so it, it writes all that stuff. And again, I can give complete details late, uh, in the talk later, but the idea is each record is written in a small batch with a transaction ID, and then the reader can figure out at read time whether they're supposed to see that transaction or not. Other, yes? 
Uh -huh. So this the question is, are, where are the statistics for the ORC file? They're actually inside. Each stripe has a footer that says, here's the statistics for this stripe, and then there's a footer at the very bottom of the, um, the ORC file that has information about where the stripes are so that you can quickly find stuff. But yeah, it's much more efficient than storing a side file because, again, you'd have block placement problems if you did it that way. Yes? What is, oh, for PIG. What's the status of ORC loader and ORC store? So that code is checked into PIG's trunk. I believe there's at least a patch, avail uh, patch available for it. Um, it's Released in HDP, it's not in PIG 13 yet, though. There were some concerns about how much of Hive got sucked into PIG when you did that, so there's some reorganization work that needs to be done to make that all there, but I know the patch is at least available, and it does work, because we've shipped it. And I apologize, but I'm actually a minute over. Um, so thank you all very much. And <laughs>